remembered that my soul chose to come to Earth. I remembered where I was before I was born. What made me come back was that I had agreed to do this before I was born. Why are we here? To learn to love. I was in a beautiful, beautiful field. The flowers were so vibrant and alive. And I realized I was looking at none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I found myself not only forgiving her, there was, there actually, after seeing everything so clearly and seeing why she was the way she was and who she really was on a soul level, after seeing that, there wasn't even a need to forgive her. It was just a big, oh, I get it now. So if I had committed a loving action, it was like love upon love upon light. A purely loving action was the most wonderful thing that I could ever achieved in my life. NDEs, or near-death experiences, are stories of those who have briefly crossed the threshold of death but were resuscitated. Testimonies reveal experiences of the realm beyond death. Decades of reports of NDEs from patients and doctors have been collected. Select experiences share esoteric insights into understanding the nature of the life after life and shine a light on the great questions of the human soul. No words were spoken, and when I asked a question, it was answered immediately. It was answered when I started asking the question, in fact. And time there does not exist as we know it. I kept receiving messages at the same time, but separately. And there were three messages that I received over and over again, and those were that we are unconditionally loved, that everything's always how it's supposed to be, and that everything will always be all right. And I knew instantly that if I didn't go back to my husband, my family, my friends, my three beautiful little babies, I knew that they'd be okay. I was shown the past, not just my past, but the past of everyone and everything. And I just had this knowing. I, I knew and I understood why everything happened. I understood that going forward in the future, there is a higher purpose and there is a reason for everything, good and bad. En van het ene moment op het andere schoot ik uit mijn lichaam. En was ik helemaal niet meer boos. En was ik weer in die ruimte die ik als thuis ervaar. Maar nu was die niet donker, niet, niet die vriendelijke nacht. Maar hij was stralend licht. En er was een energie die door, door alles heen ging, ook door mij. Hoewel ik op dat moment dus niet meer het gevoel had dat ik, dat ik in mijn lichaam was. Ik was niet meer in mijn lichaam. Maar ik was totaal die energie. En die energie was ook uh, alles tegelijk. In de zin van... Die energie was liefde. En die energie was wijsheid. Die energie was dynamiek. En ik had het gevoel alsof ik... Uh, als, als, als door osmose alles in me opnam. Ik nam die liefde in me op, ik nam die dynamiek in me op, ik nam die wijsheid in me op. Ik had het gevoel alsof ik op allerlei vragen antwoord kreeg in no time. En ik was zo gelukkig, zo ontzettend gelukkig. En ik kan niet zeggen hoe lang ik daar geweest ben. Ik heb me totaal volgedronken. En echt ook met het gevoel van... Ik heb in mijn leven altijd gebrek aan energie gehad. Omdat mijn lichaam dus zo beschadigd uit het kamp is gekomen. 
En ik heb geen tekort aan energie wat betreft de spirit. Daar heb ik overvloedig energie in. Maar het fysieke lijfje hangt er een beetje achteraan. En um, dat wordt ook steeds beter trouwens. En, um, maar die energie die aan de andere kant is, dat was voor mij het mooiste wat ik ooit had ervaren. Dat, 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 dat leven zo kan zijn. En ik wist wel dat ik niet in mijn lichaam was. Dus in zekere zin, uh, wij zeggen leven en dood. Uh, ik was niet dood, maar ik was niet in mijn lichaam. En uh, ik wou niet terug. En op een gegeven moment voelde ik eigenlijk zo'n soort samentrekken. En toen besefte ik dat ik terug moest naar mijn lichaam. En ik kreeg twee zinnen mee. En de ene was, mensen hebben lief voor zover ze kunnen. Het lijkt een dooddoener. Maar is het helemaal niet. En de tweede zin was, you don't need to go anywhere. Je hoeft nergens naartoe. En toen was het als een versnelling, als een soort zandloper. Trok die energie zich samen. En ging ik door een heel nauw kanaal naar beneden. En dat was echt diep verdriet. Want ik voelde, terwijl dat, dat kanaal zich vernauwde, dat die adem van die energie en van die dynamiek, dat die, dat die afnam. En ik voelde dat die liefde, dat er, hoe lager ik kwam, hoe meer structuren er kwamen. En hoe meer structuren er kwamen, hoe meer de liefde het raam uitvloog, de energie het raam uitvloog. En de dynamiek het raam uitvloog. En dan was ik plotseling in mijn lichaam. In alle pijn van dat lichaam. En um, toch bleef die resonantie van wat ik had meegemaakt, die bleef volop in me vibreren. En ik probeerde daar iets van te vertellen naar mijn omgeving, maar mijn dochter zei, mam, doe niet zo euforisch. En, en er zaten mensen om mijn bed heen en ze praten. En ik dacht, ze praten, maar ze zeggen niks. Wat ze zeggen is niks. Over wat ze zullen doen, wat ze gaan doen, wat ze gedaan hebben, uh, wat ze niet gedaan hebben, wat ze zullen doen, wat ze niet zullen doen, hoe ze met vakantie gaan. En het was niks. Uh, het, het had geen inhoud. En ik voelde me ongelooflijk alleen. En toen begon die zin van mensen hebben lief voor zover ze kunnen, begon aan de deur te kloppen. Dat mijn alleen gevoel ook een signaal was dat ik meer van ze verwachtte. En dat ik moest aanvaarden dat mensen lief hebben voor zover ze kunnen. You don't need to go anywhere, dat betekende dat ik volledig ben. Ik ben vrijheid. Ik hoef het niet te veroveren. Niemand kan het van me afnemen. Ik ben het. En ik hoef ook nergens naartoe om die vrijheid terug te winnen. Ik had beseft aan de andere kant, toen ik daar nog was, had ik een overzicht over mijn leven gekregen. Ook in één, één flits, om mijn hele leven... Dat je een soort holografische eenheid, dat je je hele leven kunt overzien in één uh, ogenblik. En ik zag dat ik eigenlijk sinds ik uit dat kamp gekomen was, altijd geprobeerd had uit dat kamp te komen. Ik had zoveel beperkingen meegemaakt. Ik had het gevoel dat ik me daar alsmaar van bevrijden moest. En dat word je ook. Aangepraat wil ik niet zeggen, want ik heb een stuk therapie meegemaakt om de uh, langdurig therapie meegemaakt om de emotionele, de psychische schade van die geweldstraumata ook na de kamp, om daarmee om te leren gaan. Maar in essentie ligt onder al die traumata, daar ligt gewoon je bodem. En die zielenbodem, die kan niemand van je afnemen. Die vrijheid van die ziel kan niemand van je afnemen, ook een kamp niet. En elke keer word ik dus gewekt in mijn leven aan die 
allereerste oorsprong die elke beperking te boven gaat. Maar ik ben ook mens genoeg om er vaak zo een beetje eronder te zitten. En dan krijg ik weer een schop van, de, van oh ja, oh ja, oh ja, ik vergeet het weer. Dus zo, zo gaat dat. God told us, the only way to know joy is to know sorrow. So, we had to come down to this physical realm that he made so that we could learn about sorrow so that we can have joy. So, we're not down here to prove anything to God. We're not down here to earn his love. We're not down here to do certain things to make ourselves righteous in his eyes. All those things are great. All those things are awesome. But that's not why we came down here. We came down to experience opposition. We came down here to feel the opposite. For example, we would never know what a great um, health felt like if you'd never been sick. You would never know how wonderful a day in Hawaii would be if you didn't live in a winter environment and you go to Hawaii in the middle of winter and you're going, yeah, this is awesome. And the guy on the beach that's local is like, what's the big deal, man? It's this way every day. So it's the opposition that defines us. It's the space between things that creates form. All of these things need each other. We need opposition to even know who we are. So for example, when the Lord showed me my spirit before I came to this earth, I saw this amazing, glorious, just breathtakingly beautiful, amazing warrior. And just the, the armament and the clothing and the raiment that I had on was so amazing. And I just was breathtaking to behold. So I come down here and I end up being in this little sick, weak body that spends the first seven years of its life in an oxygen tent, clinging on to life. I was skinny and scrawny up till even when I got married, my wife actually weighed more than I did. She was 118 pounds and I was 115 pounds. So I learned what it was like to be weak. I learned what it was like to have shame. I was learned what it was like to have all these things, this opposition that made me into who I am today. Even the mistakes I've made, even all the bad things I've done in my life, all the sins, all the terrible things, they helped form me into who I am today. We each have a mission to fulfill. A mission that God didn't just say, you know what, you're going on a mission. You're going to earth and this is what you're going to learn. He took what we already knew and said, what area of growth have you yet to accomplish? Now you go down and you learn. And you know what? Whenever you go to college or, or where you are required to pick your subject, don't you pick what you want? Don't you know what you want? I and mean, if you already have, uh, you know, all the math you need or English you need or whatever, why would you take it again? You wouldn't. You would take what you needed. Our earth. The world we live in right now, I was told, is like a classroom to learn to love. Not only ourselves, but to learn to love others as unconditionally as God loves us. Now that might seem to be a very simple thing. You think, okay, I can love. I love inside, I can love other people. That's not easy. Think about the people in your life. Are they easy to love? Heck no. I can tell you, my own children sometimes are difficult to love, right? They will present some of the greatest challenges on earth for you. The family that are right there in your unique little ripple will teach you the most in this life. And that saying that says, When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Absolutely. And you know that that is true in your life as well. The teacher always appears when you are ready. And it's usually a challenging person. Someone that's just going to make you grit your teeth for shudder 
every time you're around them. You pass the test when you love them anyway. That doesn't mean to be a doormat. It doesn't mean that you lay down and let other people walk on you or scrape their feet on you. What that means is, because you can distance yourself from them, but what it means is you look into their soul and you see who they are. God's creation. You hate the deeds, but you do not hate the sinner. You've heard that expression. And that's exactly what it's about. It's all about love. Another block of knowledge came in. Another whole field came into my being. And what I knew then was that the universe runs according to a perfect plan. I knew that the plan was perfect and everything that we think about as hard to understand or unfair or uh, cruel, brutal, whatever, that that was all really without meaning. Um, and I know that's very difficult, but I knew this. I understood it. I comprehended it in a way that when I came back from the experience, I really couldn't comprehend anymore. But I understood that all of the things that we worry about and that concern us, we don't have to worry about at all. There is a perfect plan, and the plan is working itself out in its perfection. Um, I was in a place where I wanted to please everyone. That was actually my addiction. Um, and what I could see on the other side is that everyone has addictions. They just look different. And none of them are more you know, important or necessary or like terrible than another. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough or you feel like you're kind of failing in certain people's eyes. But when you stop thinking like that, so being in the blender and you go in the heart and you can actually see. Jameson says her near-death experience was the best thing that ever happened to her. And I got to see really beautifully that everyone is planted, a seed is planted in their heart um, and no one is different, no one is left out. So we're all truly uniquely one. Um, and I got to see that there's a, a seed planted within us that is a mission that is not about us. Some of us lose our way in a big way where, where we, you know, we pull in things that are harmful to us and uh, circumstances that are just so hard to overcome that we almost can't overcome them or sometimes some people can't overcome them. But it's all for the greater good because you're all, you're, like what we're trying to do, we give ourselves experiences to overcome so that we can transform and almost unpeel until we can find you know, this deep seed within. And, and the ultimate importance should be placed upon our, our, our soul or our spiritual life as opposed to our physical life. But there's no way to have physical life without time and space. It's in the realm of time and space that we are able to uh, grow spiritually because only in the realm of time and space do we have the wonderful opportunity to suffer. I know that sounds very strange to you, and you'll have to forgive me, but I suppose sometimes people who've had especially multiple near-death experiences are somewhat um, odd, <laughs> myself in in included, uh, uh, because our, our perception is entirely different. I didn't tell you about my first near-death experience, but this came as a result of what was the first onset of multiple sclerosis as a result of having rheumatic fever at the age of six. I went into uh, multiple sclerosis, which uh, if you usually encounter it before the age of 10 is almost 100% uh, fatal, but very rare instances people live through it. And it was during that time uh, that I was completely vegetative and, uh, and really uh, locked in a completely useless uh, body that I had a near-death experience as a child. Um, 
it was Kenneth Ring of the University of Connecticut who I wrote the experience for, who then called me up and informed me uh, that this was a near-death experience. I hadn't labeled it as such because I actually hadn't been pronounced clinically dead for an extended period of time. But um, in this childhood experience, um, when I was brought back to the body by a grandfather, my grandfather, um, that I had never met, who had actually died when my mother was six months old, uh, when I was brought back to the body and I was grieving at the very idea of, of coming back into this physical life, especially to this horribly useless uh, body that was, you know, I had bed sores and it was just constant. Uh, any awareness that I would have would be of pain and limitation and, and whatnot. And when I was uh, uh, grieving to him uh, and, and bemoaning the fact that I was being brought back to this life at that point in time, it became very clear to me that suffering in this life can very much be a gift. Not necessarily a gift, it's a catalyst, and a catalyst is, is neutral. But uh, uh, suffering gives us the opportunity to grow spiritually. And if our true reality is spiritual and not physical, uh, and, and if our physical suffering results in the development of our spiritual being and spiritual qualities, then it can indeed be a gift. Because if you think about it, there's no moment that we can be courageous without the existence of pain and danger. There's no way that we can truly show compassion in this realm of existence unless, uh, unfortunately, someone else may be suffering. There's no way that we can truly have patience, that spiritual quality of patience, and endure unless things are not going according to how we may desire. And so, uh, if as a result of our physical suffering we can develop these eternal, these essential, these everlasting, these, these non-ephemeral uh, qualities that are going to last beyond our mere 70 years of life, you know, into, into the next realm, then we are creating our own spiritual being that we're going to take with us. And that is the most glorious of uh, achievements uh, that we can possibly have. So suffering uh, from that perspective gives us uh, the opportunity uh, to exhibit spiritual qualities and, and can indeed uh, be a gift, not that one brings it on. <laughs> Testimonies of those who return from beyond portray mortality as a small part of an existence stretching back before our mortal births and extending into an eternal future. Those who have returned convey that, by design, mortality is filled with peril, hardship, and suffering. The challenges and suffering we face present us with opportunities to learn lessons on how to love. Mortality is described as a university designed to allow us to choose to love amidst painful struggles. In our pre-Earth life, we recognized lessons we wanted to learn on Earth and accepted that certain kinds of challenges would be necessary in learning those lessons. We are all doing the very best we can for the level of personal growth we have obtained. Remembering this, can help us be patient with and forgive offenders. There is an overarching divine plan to prepare us for eternal joy, and it is working itself out in its perfection. In our next installment, we will explore what NDEs teach us about how to obtain a change of heart and become loving people prepared for the life to come.